adnoswaith a'i chi gyd a croeso i wemyn ar hyno fydd yn edrych ar atal efo chydon mewn wyn gyda'r arbenigwraig Fiona Lyfet. E, Pwng sydd ar hyn y byd bryd yn berthnasol iawn fel da ni yn dod i mewn i'r cyfnod wyna um, eleni. Good evening and welcome to our webinar this evening which will be focusing on Lyme disease prevention with Chief Specialist Fiona Lyfet from Flock Health. It is a, a, a pertinent topic which is becoming more and more relevant as we enter the lambing season for this year. Mi fydd mwy afrif y wemyn ar heno yn Saesnag, ond dwi am gwneud y cyflwyniad um, cychwynnol yn y Gymraeg um, ac hefyd yn ddwyieithog. The majority of this evening's webinar will be in English, however I will be doing this first part as an introduction um, bilingually. Fydd y wemyn ar yma yn cael eu recordio, felly os ydych chi wedi cael blwch yn dod i fyny yn gofyn i chi, um, os ydych chi'n hapus efo hyn, rydych chi plis bwysto continue. So this webinar will be recorded, therefore if you do have a, a box popping up on your screen um, asking you to click continue um, if you're happy for, to proceed. So the purpose of this really is we will be able to, to um, upload this webinar after tonight. Um, onto the Farming Connect website and it will be available shortly um, if you want to go and have a look back over what has been discussed um, tonight. Um, hefyd, gael eich atgoffa chi bod mae croeso chi ofyn cwestiwn na wrth i ni fynd ymlaen. Um, mi fydd Fiona yn stopio um, yn eithaf aml ar gyfer cwestiwn na. Um, felly mae posib i chi wneud hynny drwy glicio ar blwch Q&A sydd i fod ar waelod neu ar dopech sgrin. Uh, question and Gymraeg, and so can I just remind you that you're more than welcome to ask questions as we go along. Fiona will be stopping at regular intervals to answer some questions as we go along. So if you could please, um, if you do have any questions, please um, send them in through the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and as I mentioned previously, um, as I said, we will be we stopping regularly to answer these questions for you. Um, Felly, i gychwyn anni, na i sôn chdig bach am wasanaethau cyswllt ffermio sydd ar gael ar hyn o bryd, a hefyd um, unrhyw ddigwyddiadau a gwemyn arall gynnyn ni'n dod i fyny um, ar eich cyfar hefyd yn ofian. So to begin, I will be discussing a, a bit of different elements of the Farming Connect programme and the services that we have currently available to you to help improve your business at the moment. So to start off with, here is a bit of information on the advisory service, which is available at the moment, um, either through um, either through one-to-one, -one, uh, which is 80% funded, or through a group advice, which is uh, fully funded. Felly, reich di bach mwy wybodaeth i chi amdano gwasanaeth cynghori cyswllt ffermio sydd ar gael ar hyn o bryd. Um, mae cyngor un i un wedi ariannu hyd at 800, ac mae cyngor grŵp wedi ariannu'n llawn fel mae ar hyn o bryd. Felly, mae gennych chi wahanol categoriau um, sef business advice neu technical advice lle um, ydych chi weld ar y sgrin pa bynciau mae hyn ni um, yn cyfro mewn ffordd. So, um, the, on the screen you're able to see the topics which each category covers. So you do have the business advice and also the technical advice. Um, and if you, do, if you do have any interest in, in accessing the advisory service, you're more than welcome to contact your local development officer or you're able to contact um, us through the Farming Connect website or through the service centre in Aberystwyth. Um, also, is going to give you the mewn cael mynediad i'r gwasanaeth cynghori yma, um, mae'n groeso i chi gysylltu hefo eich swyddog, uh, swyddog datblygu lleol, um, neu mae'n groeso i chi mynd ar wefan cysylltu ffermio, neu ein ffonio i'r service centre yn Aberystwyth. Hefyd, um, gadael chi wybod bod yr er, er ffenas sgilio ar gyfer, fen, er, the, the skills funding, yr er ffenas sgiliau ar agor ar hyn o bryd, um, a mi fydd fy, fy, hwn yn cael ar y 26 o chwefror. So the skills funding window is now open until the 26 of February, um, which covers a, a wide range of training courses um, in different categories, including business, land and livestock. Um, Mae'n nifer eang fel ydych chi'n gweld o gyrsiau ar gael, um, mewn gwahanol categoriau, megis business, tier a da byw, 
a hefyd mae na bosib gallu gwneud hen drwy nifer o ddarparwyr hyfforddiant cymeradwy um, sydd wedi eich lloi drwy Gymru. Felly, what else is going on? Beth arall sydd ar y gweich ar hyn o bryd? Um, rydym ni'n ei dal yn cynnig um, cymorthfeydd un i un dros y ffôn neu yn ddigidol gyda ymgymhorwyr profiadol mewn nifer o bynciau fyddwch chi'n gweld isor, isod gan gynnwys coetir, rheoli staff, isadeiledd, tir glas, dadansoddi pridd ac ati. Um, so we are offering extra one-to-one -one surgeries either digitally or over the phone at the moment with our experts consultants which are looking at different topics including um, legal topics, accountancy, um, accountancy issues, uh, the business, beef and sheep nutrition, grassland management and also um, ICT. A dyma restr eich chi o webinarau sydd gynnyn ni'n dod i fyny yn ôl fuan. So here's a list of webinars we have up and coming in the next few days. Um, you can see there on the 20th of January we have um, a demo farm update from Bodwy, which is a demonstration site in the Hyn Peninsula. Um, we will be having a look at the projects which have been going on there over the past year um, and just getting a, a better grasp really on what they've discovered there so far. Um, there is also a similar demo farm update being held as you can see on the screen on the 25th of January at Holton Hall which is um, a farm located in the Wrexham area. Um, fel ydych chi'n gweld, mae gynna ni nifer o webinarau um, ar hyn o bryd um, ar y gweich o fewn y dyddiau nesaf. Hefyd, os gaid yn eich sylwch chi tuag at um, digwyddiad sy'n gynna ni ar yr ugeinfa do ionawr, sef demo fam update yn bodwy fferm ym hen hun, um, am i fydd y digwyddiad yma yn edrych ar y project a sy'n wedi bod yn digwydd yno um, gan edrych yn benodol ar y fenter bwl beef um, ag ati. Hefyd, mae mi, mi fydd gynna ni yn tebyg yn digwydd um, ar gyfer ffermd ar ddangos Holton Hall yn ardal wrecsam, Wrecsam a mi fydd hwnnw ymlaen ar y 25 poi o nawr. Felly, er mwyn cofrestru ar gyfer hyn i, mae'n croeso chi fynd draw i webanc os o'i ffermio. Um, moving on swiftly, um, just to let you know also that we have one-to-one -one telephone and digital assistance for those um, with basic IT skills. Um, so this is up to two fully funded um, two hours telephone conversations um, to offer you support from specialist IT tutors, um, just so you can get more used to using um, IT related uh, packages um, and any issues that you may have with your own personal devices. Felly, um, dim ond gadael chi wybod bod gynna ni diwtorau un i un ar gyfer hyn i um, sydd hefo sgiliau technoleg gwybodaeth sylfaenol um, yn digwydd ar hyn o bryd, sef hyd at ddau ymwyliad dwy awr o hyd um, wedi eu harian ein llwyr gan diwtoriaid um, technoleg gwybodaeth arbenigol. Uh, Mae'r hyfforddiant yma wedi delwra yn benodol ar gyfer eich gofynion chi um, ac maen nhw'n canolbwyntio ar unrhyw problemau technoleg gwybodaeth sy'n gynnwch chi um, ar eich dyfais personol eich hun um, ac unrhyw bro, ja, broblemau pellach sy'n gynnwch chi hefo technoleg gwybodaeth. Felly, dyma gronodeb sydyn o'r swyddogion datblygu lleol ym mhob ardal o Gymru. Um, os ydych chi angen unrhyw wybodaeth pellach am wasanaethau cyswllt ffermio a sydd wedi cael mynediad oedden nhw mae croeso chi gysylltu hefo'r swyddog datblygu yn eich ardal chi. So here's a quick run through of the Family Connect Development Offices, um, which are located throughout Wales. If you do, do need any information on any of the Family Connect services, which I have mentioned tonight, or any of our other services which are available, you're more than welcome to contact our local development officers in your area, um, and they will be happy to help. And lastly, here is just um, a, a a quick um, slide which shows you um, the contact details for the Farm Liaison Service located um, across Wales. Um, they, are offered to, um, they are able to offer advice about policies and grants um, and so on. So if you need to, to discuss any issues, you're more than welcome to contact them. So the mag um, granodeb sydyn o Manolion Cyswllt, a team cysylltu i'r ffermd FLS sydd ar gael ledled Cymru. Ac os oes gennych chi unrhyw broblemau neu unrhyw ymoliadau am polisiau a grantiau, mae greu sych cysylltu hefo nhw. Neu, yn olaf, um, dyma rhy ffôn y Service Center um, ar gyfer cysylltu ffermio a hefyd cyfeiriad ein gwefan. Um, os ydych chi angen rhywbeth, mae creu sych chi cysylltu unrhyw adeg. 
Um, so here is um, the phone number for the Service Centre for the Family Connect programme. Also, here is the website's address um, if you need any more information on anything, and you're more than welcome to contact us anytime. Felly, um, symud ymlaen i'n siaradwr gwaedd heno, um, Fiona Lovett. So we'll move forward to our um, speaker for this evening, which is Fiona Lovett, um, which works for Flock Health um, and is an independent uh, sheep specialist. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, our topic for this evening is lamb disease prevention, um, which Fiona will be discussing now in more detail. So I'll pass you on to Fiona. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you do have any questions, please send them in as we go along through the Q&A um, box on the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer as much um, questions as we possibly can. Um, so welcome, Fiona, and I'll pass on to you. Thank you very much, Gwa. Um, Well, uh, thanks for the welcome. I'm very relieved I'm not doing this in Welsh as well, um, so I'm afraid it's all in English. I'm going to talk about lamb disease um, prevention, perfect time of the year for that. So I'm sure that if you're not already lambing yourselves, you'll be preparing your ewes, you'll be sorting out what you're feeding them, you'll be getting, making sure you've got your lambing staff ready. I actually want to find out a bit more about um, who I've got listening now. And so I'm launching this poll. So hopefully you'll be able to access this from your um, device. So whether if you're on a computer, um, the questions should have come up. And if you're on a uh, an iPad or a, a phone, um, it's slightly harder to find the polls, but if you um, flick through and look for the um, uh, screen, you should be able to answer the polls. So I'll read through them for the benefit of anyone who can't. So this is just to help me know who I'm talking to and what stages you're all at. So the first question is when you start lambing this year. Are you starting, have you started, are you starting in January, February, March, April, or are you a late lamber in May? So, um, uh, and then th there's no point talking to you if you've all, all finished lambing already, um, which I know will not be the case. Um, the next question, I just want to try to get an idea of the sort of size of farms that you've got, the people in the audience. Um, and I can see already just from the, uh, about half of you have voted so far. Um, and every single person who's voted has said that they are lambing used this year. So um, we've obviously got, got the right audience here. And then my final question in this poll is what you're most worried about facing this lambing time in terms of disease issues. Are you worried that you might get lambs that get watery mouth or rattle belly? Are you worried that you might get lambs getting joint ill? Or maybe you might get lambs getting scour? Maybe you're worried that your ewes might not have enough milk or colostrum, or maybe it's something else on your mind. We, it's been snowing all day here today, um, uh, and really <laughs> poor weather. We, we can all think back to 2018, and um, for a lot of farmers, that was a really bad weather year. Is that the sort of thing that you're really concerned about? Right, we've had over 100 people vote, so I'm going to close the voting very soon. So if you haven't yet pressed your button, get on and, and do it now. Um, I'll end the polling there and share the results. So hopefully you can see that. So with this audience, um, half of you are lambing in, are starting to lamb in March. So um, some of you lambing now, quite a few starting in February. So, okay, that's about what I was expecting to be honest. Um, so that's great. We have at least got, for most of you, we've got six weeks before you actually start lambing. 45% uh, of you are lambing between 300 and 1,000 ewes. So, um, uh, you know, we've got some quite big flocks out there and a few of you with over 1,000 ewes. Um, so, okay. And the, what are you most worried about? Oh, it's pretty close. Um, a quarter of you, 26% worried about lambs getting joint till. 23% worried about lambs getting watery mouth, rattle belly, um, and 25% worried about ewes not having enough milk or colostrum. All really valid things to be concerned about, and hopefully um, we'll discuss them all um, as we go as we go through tonight. So I'll stop sharing that and go back to my slides. Um, at the moment, 
likelihood is you just have your lambing, um, your scanning figures. So, so some people, um, I know uh, farmers locally who've been scanning today or scanning tomorrow, not great in, in the amount of snow that we've had. Um, but uh, the numbers of lambs you count in your, in your ewes now is one thing. We know we won't have as many born and we know you won't turn out as many. And then we lose lambs up to weaning and the number we actually sell is less again. So um, that's one of the things we want to stop is this wastage between what you know you've got in your use now, your potential for your flock and what you actually end up selling at the end, um, uh, you know, back at the end of the year um, or, or, when it, or whenever it is that you're selling your lambs. And there's all this, all these factors that are coming in there. Um, so tonight, obviously we're concentrating uh, mainly at lambing time because that's what's relevant but um, we're going to talk a little bit about abortion and I'll talk about lamb deaths around this stage uh, around um, why, why are we losing lambs at that early stage and we and we do have a bit of data on that and it's um it's Welsh data from HCC it is a, it's a good 10 years old now but um we know that 30 percent of all lamb losses so a third are caused um basically between between scanning and lambing we do have losses of, of um, lambs at that stage um, and then the, the vast majority so half the losses of all lambs is at lambing time that's what we're really working to um, prevent um, so uh, and but before we really concentrate in on the diseases the thing about vets is we always like to talk about the diseases and actually I want to just take a step back and look at the bigger picture so what is it why is it that you've got sheep in the first place and I'm going to come from the um, viewpoint is that you're trying to run a business now I know not all of you will be keeping sheep because it's a business but that's how um, that's how I work with my clients and um, we're we're what are, the pro what are the drivers of profitability in your flock? And basically, we want you to, to be outputting the maximum that's suitable for your flock. It doesn't necessarily mean the highest number, but what is the optimum number for um, your ewes to be sustaining on, on your farm? So we want to maximize that number of lambs that you end up selling, not the lambs that you've got now at scanning time. The, the number we really want to maximize is what you sell at the end. And we want to do that at minimum costs. So that means spreading your fixed costs. It means making sure you're not spending too much on your variable costs. And when we look at variable costs, the biggest cost is your replacements. But you feed, feed for the, your use comes in very closely behind, not, not closely behind in figures, but it's the next major cost that you have on your farm. And the variation in what people spend on you feed is huge. Sometimes it's because you having a you're going to have a panic in the next month or two, and I see it time and again. Of it's the last month before lambing, and somebody goes out and spends an absolute fortune on blocks or buckets or high energy this because if suddenly in a panic, and it's a sort of insurance policy. Um, sometimes it's 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 a lot of money that's not spent in a panic. But um, one of the things, one of the reasons we're so busy at the moment is because we're sorting out diets with people We're we're going through analysis of forage we're working out exactly what you've got what assets you've already got on the farm what forage you're feeding how good the quality is and is it is it good enough that we we can be as efficient as possible in the costs that we're buying in the feed that we're buying in um, so uh, that that's a really important way to look at it but on the other end of the scale it's really, really important that we don't shave so much in those feeding costs that we've got ewes that can't support um, lambs. You know, it, it really matters how good your forage is and it really matters how those ewes are being fed so that they, they're in their optimum, optimum body condition score and fed well and the lambs have the best chance. And then ultimately you wanna be sending lambs at a, at a good price um, at the right time of the year, suitable for your flock. I'm just going to talk about maximum flock output because every lamb does count and I know what it's like in a lambing shed and I know what it's like at lambing time and every lamb does count you 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 really feel it when you lose a lamb and and we can appreciate that we want there to be lots of lambs we want 
um, this is, you know, this has all happened now. You, you needed your tubs to be fertile. You needed your ewes to be in the best condition. You didn't want a load of barren ewes. And, and really, I know you want them all to go out with twins. Um, uh, perfect situation. We also um, want to be controlling abortion. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can, isolating ewes that are bought um, so they don't spread it, investigating which abortion it is. If somebody comes to me, one of you comes to me and says, oh, I had a load of bought last year, what can I do about it? I can't possibly tell you, apart from isolate your ewes, um, I can't possibly tell you without knowing what's caused that abortion. But we, we can, you know, there are principles and, and hopefully you're working with a good vet and, and you know what to do. But I will talk about abortion a bit in a minute. Um, but then once you've got lambs born, you really want to keep them alive. Um, you need really strict attention to detail, good hygiene, and to be targeted about your disease control. And that's one of the things we're going to very much talk about um, through the webinar tonight. So I've said about maximum flock output, and it's got to be at minimum costs. But minimum costs does not mean cutting out on the important things. So yes, we do want to save on the cost, the costs of treating disease, the costs of loss of production, the costs of, of lambs dying. Absolutely, we want to stop that. But it means that we have to be spending potentially on prevention. We need to be um, investing wisely. And, um, and, and partly this good prevention means using um, using our medicines well. It's not just giving an antibiotic jab. If we could have done something prior to that, we could have vaccinated. It's um, it's doing the right thing. It's it's saving costs where we can save costs. It's maximizing outputs and it's being responsible about how we use medicines. And that's one of the things um, we'll talk about as we go through. So I said I'd talk about abortion. This is quite a busy slide and I, I wasn't sure whether to show it, but now is the absolute time for the, all of those of you um, lambing February, March, um, that you you need, to, you know, if you go out there and find ewes that have slipped their lambs in the morning, you know, need to know what am I going to do about it. And I'm just going to highlight a few really important things on this um, whole sheet. Um, so the, the principles are to plan ahead prevent disease happening and protect the flock. But right now, the fact that we're mid January and you're lambing in the next six to seven weeks, do not mix pregnant ewes. So it's fine for ewes of your own flock, but if you've got a bunch of ewes that you've bought from elsewhere, please don't mix them in with your own flock at this crucial stage because we want to be as cautious as we can and mixing pregnant ewes, whether it's endozootic abortion or whether it's border disease or whether it's Campylobacter, um, particularly endozootic abortion and border disease, um, now is the time not to be unnecessarily mixing ewes that are pregnant. Um, do not plan to use antibiotics in your flock. It is totally unacceptable to inject all your ewes before lambing with an antibiotic. It is totally unnecessary. There are large parts of the country, there are many, many sheep farmers who cannot understand why other sheep farmers inject all their ewes with antibiotics. So if you are doing that, please talk to your vet and discuss it and, um, and don't do it. It is totally unacceptable and not necessary, unless you have had confirmed endotic abortion in your flock last year, confirmed in a lab, then we might want to do it. And if you take um, abortion in to a lab this year and we get a diagnosis, we may say it's a good idea to use an antibiotic. But that does that is very different from just routinely using antibiotic. It's, um, and it's, and it's not because we're being awkward, it's because we're trying to save you having further problems on your flock. Because if we use these antibiotics unnecessarily, it is going to cause you problems down the line. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And the third thing I just want to highlight for this, and I said it a few slides ago, is if you do have a ewe slip her lambs, please get her out of the flock. Get her out of that group put her somewhere by herself, she is infectious and she will 
um, increase the risk of those users around her aborting. Either, if it's Campylobacter, she'll increase the risk of them aborting this year. They will abort one or two weeks later after they picked it up from that first ewe. So that's a very good reason to get her out. And if it's endotic abortion, they will store that up in them and they will be ready to abort next lambing. Next year will be a, a problem for you. So um, that is the one, uh, the key most important thing for you to do if you've got um, a you abort is to isolate it. And it doesn't cost you anything. I know it's a hassle. I know a lot of sheep farmers say it's a bit hard to do that. And I know you will miss some, but please don't miss the ones that you do see get them out of the flock and you'll save yourself a lot of problems. So there's a lot else on that sheet, um, but that's sort of for another time. I would honestly say at this time, um, six weeks before lambing, those are your three most important things to remember with respect to abortion. And otherwise, apart from that, I'm not gonna talk about abortion again, but I'm more than happy to answer questions as, as we go through. So back to the big picture, keeping lambs alive. So lamb survival depends on ewes being in a good body condition score, and that's from before they went to the tup. So um, before they went to the ram, we needed them to be in good body condition score, but keep on it and keep an eye on it. And, um, you know, those of you, we, we've been working with quite a few um, farmers looking at body condition score, making sure we've got um, ewes in the right group. That is really important. And the other thing... Um, we've also been doing is making sure that people are feeding it right I've already mentioned you nutrition and now it is crucial so any of you who are lambing in the next six to eight weeks it is from now that you really need to be thinking about you you, you nutrition um, particularly for your twins and your triplets um, often in terms of protein it's not to the last couple of weeks where it really matters but energy um we generally start, depending on the, how good the forage is, from six to eight weeks before lambing. Um, I've, I've got some farmers who the forage is, is brilliant and we're starting to, to feed the twins um, four weeks before because they've got quite enough just from the silage up to now. But, but we do a quite complicated um, analysis to work out exactly what to do based on the, on the forage analysis. Um, but the, the important thing is think about energy from six to eight weeks on and then protein for the last two to three weeks is where it really, really matters when the user are making colostrum. We really need good colostrum. Um, and that's one of the keys. And I'll talk about that again. Um, we really need good hygiene and that's how we end up with happy, healthy lambs. And those are the sort of key outside things to be thinking about um, for your flock. So back to this slide again, and I'm just gonna launch the next poll because I'm talking particularly now about um, watery mouth. So from this audience, I would really interested to know if you think about lambing, your lambing on your farm last year, how many cases of watery mouth did you actually have? that you actually saw and thought, those are cases of watery mouth, I need to do something about it. Um, uh, was it one to 10% or was it over 10%? And the next question is, um, I'm wanting to know whether you gave antibiotics, whether you dosed lambs with antibiotics. So is it that you gave a dose to no lambs at all? Is it that you gave a dose of Spectam or Orijet to some of your lambs or to all of your lambs? Or did you perhaps give either a tablet or a different antibiotic um, to some or all of your lambs? Um, by the way, just in case you, anyone's concerned, I have no idea who's answering what question. So <laughs> please be honest. There's, there's no reason not to be honest. Um, uh, it's just really helpful for me to know how, how my audience is, is um acts at home so I know what to say basically and then um exactly the same question but has have you changed what you've done with antibiotics for newborn lambs um so was last year different to what you did previous to that um we've had over 100 people vote so I'll just give you another couple of minutes 
Um, I'm it's quite sure that some of you probably can't vote. Yeah. Um, so, right, I'll end the polling there. 125 people, that's quite a good. Um, have I shared those results, Segwa? No, hang on, that's it. That should have shared, yeah? Okay. So answer to your question, how, how many cases last year? So the vast 40, 44% of this audience had under 1% of your lambs had watery mouth and 31% um, of you had um, under 10% of your lambs have watery mouth and then a quarter of you had no lambs at all. It's quite interesting. Um, I like asking that question because often when you speak to farmers, you get the impression that watery mouth is a massive problem. And then you look at that and you think that is not a massive problem. You know, under 1%, mo most of this audience had less than 1% of their lambs. I know it's bad. I know it's bad for those lambs, but um, it's important to put it in the big picture. And, and we do want to save every lamb but we need to be proportionate about what we do about it. Um, okay, so that's very interesting. Last year, did you give antibiotics into mouth of newborn lambs? 46% of you to no lambs at all. Brilliant. 34% uh, to summer lambs. Only 15% gave a dose to all your lambs. That's quite interesting. And that's, that is, um, but that's, that's actually brilliant no, news. Um, I'll show you some of the figures um, because generally the um, we do have fewer people dosing every lamb, but there are still quite a few who do, and we will definitely discuss it. And just a very few of you giving tablets, um, which I have to say, I'm pleased, there, there are no there are no tablets licensed in sheep. So if you are giving tablets, um, you need to be having a conversation with your vet. You can send your vet, I'll have a conversation with your vet if you like. Um, really, um, no vet should be giving out tablets for lambs. Um, uh, and it had, that hasn't changed dramatically, although few, few of you have said um, that there were more of you giving lamb, a dose to all lambs in the past. And there were a few more of you giving tablets, but um, even that, um, we certainly had, we certainly, thought it was it was more than that in the past um so um but things change and that's great so um thank you um thank you for voting there um i'll stop sharing that and go back to here and we're going to so we're going to talk specifically about watery mouth and watery mouth um it has been common for people to be giving um doses of antibiotics oral doses um to lambs um healthy lambs um, to prevent them getting watery mouth um, and actually you can see back in um, lambing of, two th of 2016 uh, across the UK we had uh, 11 and a half million doses of oral antibiotics sold. Um, it's a figure that I personally are hugely embarrassed about um, uh, uh, and we have worked on it and it is decreasing. Um, so Last year, there were seven and a half million doses of oral antibiotics given to lambs. Um, it's worth just saying, so um, there's a picture here of Spectam Scarhole, that's the most common. Um, Orijet's another common oral antibiotic that people give. Um, it is just worth saying, where you look at the VARS report, which is um, antibiotic data, uh, the reason people give oral antibiotics as a prophylactic, in other words, to healthy lambs, to try and prevent them getting watery mouth. Um, it's to prevent uh, E. coli. And if we just look at this, when they take isolates of E. coli from lambing sheds, half of them are resistant to spectinomycin, which is the, um, which is the antibiotic found in spectam. And if, if, you give, if you used to give the yellow tablets, the oxytetracycline tablets to lambs, um, well over half, over 60% of E. coli are resistant to uh, oxytetracycline. So in, the, in that case, on half those farms, um, it doesn't make any difference if you're giving that antibiotic. It won't make any difference for watery mouth um, because of resistance. And it's because as an industry, we used to 
give a lot of oral antibiotics prophylactically to lambs. And in some cases, farmers still are. Um, we are all we're going to do is increase this number of resistance and that once an antibiotic is resistance, we cannot use it. It will not work. The bugs are cleverer than we are and they can um, they can survive. Um, a resistant bug can survive an antibiotic. So but um, but bear with me and I'm not trying to scare you. What um, the good practice guidelines and so this sheep vet society and um, room and responsible use of medicines in agriculture um, who, uh, and the graphs are put on the previous slide um, we put together in the rumor report. Um, the good practice guidelines say that in individual flocks and with close veterinary supervision, it may be appropriate to use targeted control measures, including antibiotics, but in no flock no flock will it be appropriate for all lambs to be treated routinely from the start of the lambing season so that means if you're lambing in the next couple of months it is not you you cannot now say my first lamb born i'm going to give an antibiotic to and then i'm going to give it to all my lambs because um it, that is that I'm afraid is not appropriate and the reason it's not appropriate is because we're trying to save the far far worse issues in your flock so but I realize for some people that is that is really worrying and they really really want to be using antibiotics on every lamb born and I'm going to talk you through it because um, I've worked with a huge number of flocks and I can honestly say there is not one flock that needs to be doing this from the start of lambing, not even your flock. So um, bear with me. Um, if we think about factors that are important for, for the success of lambing, we think about the ewes, we can think about the shepherd and we think about the environment. Those are my three most important things. The shepherd is responsible for planning ahead. We need to protect the ewes and we need to prevent issues in the environment. OK, and now I'm taking that into a, in another picture in the next slide. We're planning ahead. Um, and so what does planning ahead mean for you as a shepherd? It means sorting out the diet. We've already talked about that. That's a brilliant thing. And I know a lot of you and, and through Farming Connect particularly have been analysing your forage and sorting out, making sure that your user have got a quality diet. Um, you need to plan. You need to plan your staff. You need to plan what you're going to do at lambing time. Coming to this webinar, this is a perfect way to be planning ahead of what you're going to do. And you need to be thinking about colostrum. You need to be thinking about met records and things. Prevent, preventing problems. Now, if you're lambing outside, that, that might mean sufficient shelter. It, it might mean putting bales up, um, doing what you can to prevent um, uh, lambs getting exposed in poor weather. If you're lambing inside, it means um, clean, plenty of um, fresh bedding, um, no drafts. It means turning the ewes out as quickly as possible before they get before the lambs are build up in a in a in a mucky shed. It means hygiene as good as you can, and it means everything being as clean and as as it possibly can be. Um, stomach tubes, uh, teats, ear taggers, everything clean as much as possible. And then in terms of your use, we've said they need to be fit, good body condition score, they need to be fed well, um, good diet, they need to be fully vaccinated, they need to be sound, and they need to be dagged, they need to be clean, you don't want any, you don't want anything there that's going to upset the lamb. And if they are well fed, um, and in good body condition score, they've got every option, they've got every possibility to make the best colostrum they can. And the colostrum is what's really important. You will have seen this before, colostrum is gold. Really, the most important treatment, put it in inverted commas, the most important thing, the only important thing that goes down a lamb's throat at birth is colostrum. It's, um, it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, and it's without colostrum, then we do need to turn to other options. If we've got good quality colostrum and we've done what we can to get good quality colostrum, um, our lambs have the best chance of, um, of, of doing all right. Now, some of you still want to dose all your lambs at birth. I know you do. Um, and if you don't, there are plenty of sheep farmers that do. And there are a couple of reasons for this. It might be that you have a genuine current risk of watery mouth 
Although I have to say from that poll, um, there were there were there were a few of you there were a few of you that had up to ten percent of your lambs, and I agree. If you're getting ten percent of lambs with watery mouth, I agree you have a current genuine risk. But that was last year. You have no idea what's going to happen next year, uh, this year. Um, you might uh, have had a previous outbreak, and you you started to use an antibiotic, and you're fearful to stop. You might have heard people talk about using antibiotics and that's why you do too. Or you might genuinely think, actually, it's quite good to be giving lambs antibiotics at birth. I have to say, um, a lot of the evidence is showing it's actually um, upsetting that biome in a lamb's stomach when an antibiotic at birth is, is far more likely to be detrimental than, than beneficial. Um, but in whatever whatever the whatever the reason is that you give antibiotics to your lambs at birth, I would encourage you to work with your vet um, and to divide the flock into high risk and low risk groups so you can be targeted about about what you do do, and then you can allow for changes as as lambing as you go on through lambing. So if you're deciding which lambs should I give a dose of antibiotic to? Um, if you're somebody who used to do everything and you're gonna try and not do everything, and that's what I'd really encourage you to not treat every lamb, you might still want to treat your higher risk ones. So that might be, uh, if you have a case, any lambs in that small area, I would potentially you give antibiotics to them for a couple of days in that area. Um, triplets or low birth weight rams, lambs are high risk. Any born to a thin ewe or a ewe that's poorly, um, for whatever reason, she, was, she wasn't doing well herself. Um, when the environmental conditions are really challenging, um, if it's really cold, really wet, really snowy, and there's a buildup of muck, um, you know, when things start to go wrong because of um, weather staffing and going as you go on through lambing, potentially it becomes higher risk and potentially you might want to start using an antibiotic. Preferably you won't have to, um, but you might want to have a bottle there on hand in case those circumstances start. But there is absolutely no reason and it's probably detrimental to be giving, um, it, it's definitely detrimental to be giving unnecessary antibiotics, but um, lambs that have adequate colostrum absolutely do not need a dose. Um, fit, healthy, single lambs, lambs born in the first week when everything's clean and dry, um, they don't need a box. So I will challenge everybody here. We've got 150 or so people on this call. How far can you go through lambing before you open a bottle? And I mean a bottle of Spectam or whatever. Um, so don't think of all, don't think you have to do the same thing for your whole flock, but be targeted about, if you have to use antibiotics, dosing antibiotics, be targeted about it. Um, Okay, let's just go on to this next slide. And Gua, I wondered, should we have some um, questions? Yes, of course. Um, Fiona, we have a few questions coming in. Um, you noticed on your, um, one of the, one of our attendees tonight noticed that on your abortion slide, um, you recommended not to foster ewe lambs onto ewes that had aborted. Is there a particular reason why for this? Oh yes. So if you've got endotic abortion, in the flock and you put a ewe lamb onto that ewe, uh, that ewe lamb uh, is potentially picks it up and is programmed to abort at her first lambing. So if you're keeping your ewe lambs, definitely keep them away from any aborted ewes. It, it's not so much an issue if, you're, if they're just selling fat, you know, finished lambs. Yeah, no, I, I think um, that's maybe something um, a lot of us tonight haven't heard before. So. Um, it's good to get a clarification on that. Um, some other questions we have coming in. Um, the first question we had come in this evening. Is there a strong potential for pathogen burden in an earth floor lambing shed? Um, in, in case of this particular farmer, uh, they lamb indoors from late February on until early April. Um, they do also have feet problems. Um, so yeah, do you so, think that they're in the shed? So in, a, in an ideal situation, you want to be able to clean out from one lambing, um, get down to proper hardcore or concrete, 
and clean it out and disinfect and let it dry, dry and have um, ultraviolet light, just sunlight on it. That's your ideal situation. And you obviously can't do that with an earth floor and you can't, the more, the more you wash it clean, the more it turns to a kind of mud rather than earth. So um, it, it, it is, it's much harder to deal with. I, th I think I would, um, I would get a load of lime in probably. So lime works quite well because it raises the pH and bugs don't like that high pH. So that's one thing I would probably use. If, if you've got a, an earth floor and you can't do anything about it, a good layer of lime before you bed. Um, uh, but yeah, if hard, hardcore sort of better. Um, I'd, whilst we just go through the questions as well, maybe I'll just launch this this second poll. So if people are able to multitask, that might, because um, uh, I've got a poll there about joint till. Do you want me to answer any of these other questions whilst we're on, Gua? Uh, yes, if you can, uh, just a few qu uh, quickly. Um, do, do you have any opinions on bought in colostrum um, powder form? Yes, so... Um, there's a massive range in colostrum quality. Uh, there have been a couple of studies in the different um, colostrum products. Uh, the, the key is the level of IgG, the immunoglobulin in them. But even having said that, the very, very best powders are only half as good as a used own colostrum. So um, there is a range. A used colostrum is, is the kind of gold standard. Um, uh, Cow colostrum is okay. It's it's thirty percent less good than used colostrum. It's not as good energy and it's not as good protein. I have got a slide on colostrum actually, so I will cover that. But the the long and short of powdered colostrum is yeah, is a very 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 last resort if you can possibly harvest colostrum off a ewe that's had a single or or used in the shed, which I know is hard work at lambing, but that's better option um, if possible. Yeah, Somebody then. says, what's the best bedding to use um, to prevent joint or water mouth? Yeah, and yeah. Um, so there are some, some people have good success with, um, with uh, shavings. Uh, it, it's not like there's one thing that's better than the other, but um, sometimes shavings can work well, although wet, wet you know, in a wet environment, nothing's very good and good clean dry bedding is key and actually you know properly clean dry um so there's not a single answer to that to be honest um, um, while well, well, we're still on the bedding um topic um fiona uh, would you recommend perhaps mucking out if if you are indoors lambing would you recommend mucking out a few days before you begin lambing um just to yeah just to uh, them so out. mucking out, if you can properly get down to um, right down to the bottom and clean properly and then properly bed up above it, that's great. If mucking out for you means going down and getting to that really gunky, black, smelly layer, I would say d don't do that because you've got to put a heck of a lot more bedding on top before the, you know, so mucking out, it means properly cleaning out and getting down to, to a clean floor and then putting lime or granules or disinfectant and then bedding up well, you know, that's brilliant. But um, I've definitely seen mucking out that's caused more problems than good because it, all it's done is turned all the bugs up close to the, to the surface. Um, uh, good bedding um, and regularly um, changed is, is, is good. Um, Right, brilliant. People are answering the joint tail questions as we're going along, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, somebody there asked about, does lime help prevent watery mouth? The key for watery mouth is definitely um, getting colostrum, um, getting colostrum in. Uh, lime will help with bugs generally, uh, yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's not only making sure the used colostrum is good enough, but it's making sure the lambs get it and they get it quickly. They get enough and they get it quickly enough. Um, right, I'm going to, we've had over 120 people vote, so I'm going to stop this poll um, and share these. So this is now, we're going on to, to joint till. Uh, how many cases of joint till? So 46 of you had 
less than one percent of ewes had a joint till a lambs had joint till a quarter of you up to ten percent and then um and i really feel for these guys uh the, there are just a couple who had over 10% of lambs joint till. Joint till is really hard and it's really, it's a really difficult um, thing to deal with. So I do feel for you if you've had um, joint till like that, but that's, that's good. Thank you. It's given me an idea of what we're dealing with. And then when we've asked about antibiotics, um, a third of you have been injecting some newborn lambs and, a, and just a very small number have been injecting all your newborn lambs. Um, and that again, that's actually, um, I, I know there are some farms where because they've been worried about joint till, they've started injecting all lambs, but actually um, in this audience, it shows that there's, that's not huge numbers of you. Very few actually. Um, okay, let me just stop showing that. I'm going to talk. Go on to joint till. Joint till is, um, is caused by this bug called Streptococcus dysgalactii. There is another bug that does cause joint till, but in older lambs, most likely the type of joint till we get at, at, in um, lambs up to a um, couple of weeks old um, is caused by Streptococcus dysgalactii by a long, long way. That's the most common bug. And it can get into the lamb via any route you like. It can get in via the navel, it can get in via a castration wound, via a dock tail, it can get in with an ear tag, it can get in through the nose, mouth, tonsils if you put a tube down or anything. And all these things are potential things to carry the, the joint tail to the lamb. So we know we get ewes who are carrier ewes and they have it in their birth canal. So the minute the lamb is born, it picks up the strep as it comes out through the birth canal. We know these carrier ewes also have the bug on their teats and in their milk, so they can transfer it to their lambs, um, uh, and and th so their lambs are much more likely to go down with joint till. We also know that um, it can be spread on tubes, bottles, on your dirty hands. If you've lambed a ewe, um, and so you've had your hand inside one ewe and picked up the strep on your own hand and then gone and dealt with a, a separate lamb or tagged another lamb or, you know, then you've transferred the strep from the carrier you into maybe her own lamb, but, but her own lamb, other lambs who, who haven't otherwise had contact with her birth canal. So that's one of the reasons having, being as clean as possible is important. And joint till, in the past, we always used to think it was a kind of disease of dirty lambing sheds and, I honestly, I have seen joint till on some absolutely immaculate farms um, and they've had a problem with joint till. And I think it's because they have a lot of carrier ewes and they get a lot of lambs infected that way. We know that, that strep, um, streptus galactia can survive well on dry straw. So um, it's, not, it's not just a disease of dirty conditions. Um, so, uh, and a lot of people, were told that in the past and they were told well as long as you keep um uh disinfecting the navel you'll stop drawing till you know that that's it is important to be good on your or disinfecting navels or to be iodining or um and do that at birth and potentially do it six hours later as well but that's not the that's not the only cause and it's not always in dirty lambing sheds it can be in quite clean lambing sheds um so what do we do about drawing till we again, we consider all practices and make sure that you have, have really gone through with a fine tooth comb, everything that you're doing on your, on your farm um, and, and work with your vet to work out what it is. There is not a single cause and there's not a single thing that you can do. There's a myriad of different things that you can do to help vent joint till. And, and gloves use plenty of lubricant and gloves and, and make sure you realize you're in a labor ward it's really important to be clean um, uh, and make sure everything's sterilized so you need to have a sterilizing 
pop there don't don't and i know what it's like you've got, you're really under pressure and you really want to get that colostrum into that lamb and you've got a dirty stomach tube from from last night or from an hour ago or whatever and you use the same one again well if the lamb you used it in before had a mother who was a carrier and they picked up strep and now you've just transmitted it to the next lamb that used the same stomach tube in so we have to do everything we can um, to help prevent it and it may be that you do have to start using antibiotics in that group of lambs, um, but you don't, um, it, it can be for a short while. And please don't think just because you had a bad joint till last year that you need to start using antibiotics next year because that is not the case. Um, we, it is a complicated and it's a frustrating disease, but we've dealt with it with a number of farms. In fact, this, these pictures here, um, are an old building in my, my colleague um, Philip that I work with they've had years where they had joint till problems and they've been really tempted to go in with antibiotics they, they've they've controlled it in those groups um, and they and but they haven't the following years they've they've not had the same problems so they know with that with this particular building a wet a wet weekend um, there can be a buildup of moisture and it can set away joint till and they and they 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 know what sets it off on their farm they've really looked into it and they know when they when they need to be cautious when they need to keep an eye on things and they potentially need to be targeted um, with some antibiotics but they never just use antibiotics routinely um, um, in the last, um, we, I've spoken to a number of different vets, um, actually from all over the world, who've been dealing with joint tilt issues. Um, and I know people have done studies on farms in Wales. Um, and Riddler, she's in New Zealand, we spoke to her a couple of months ago, actually. And, um, and she was saying how notable it was farms that had a bad joint till one year, um, it seems to just... It, it's not there in future years, and that's not because they're using antibiotics. It's because it, it comes and goes with different, with all those different factors we've spoken about. Um, so, uh, uh, and exa exactly same as some Spanish vets where they they had issues. Um, the vet they're dealing with it said to me, you know, I'm absolutely convinced it's something that we had some problems with and we just don't seem to have the problems on those farms anymore. Something's different. So we don't have all the answers, but we do absolutely know that prophylactic antibiotic treatment is not the answer. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got to look at all the other options um, and we successfully do, um, you know, we work through it with people. Um, but it is it is frustrating disease and if you have it you know you, you do have my sympathies and um you know we do need to, you do need to work carefully with a vet to look at all the different things don't think it's just one one reason um tags is an interesting one so um because streptoscalacti lives well on in in clean areas or or even in dry dust just don't forget your ear taggers if they sat on a shelf and got dusty or if you've picked out what you think are new tags out of the bag they're not sterile you need to I would spirit those I would spirit the ear before I put the tags in and I, I would I, if I my hands have been in a lambing shed and then I put a tag in the ear tagger I've probably contaminated that ear tag then I click it through the through the ear of a lamb it's straight into the bloodstream and potentially um, causing joint ills. So, you know, it's it's not always taggers, but if you're not absolutely stringently hygienic with your tagging, that might be the reason. Um, it's definitely not always the reason, but it could be if you're not doing it properly. You know, it's a it's a surgical thing. You're going through the skin. Anything that goes through the skin can introduce a bug, um, and and that's the same with tagging. Right. Do we have, have we got any particular joint till questions that you want me to cover there, um, Gua? Yeah, I think um, we have quite a lot of questions. So I'll pick the three or four, um, which are the most common ones, Fiona. Um, so what would you recommend putting on the lamb navels in order to avoid issues with joint till? Is there anything in particular which is better than... than oh, the now, we have this debate quite often. I've done quite a lot of um, looking through the literature first off and looking in piglets and calves and... Uh, 
uh, and on balance, a strong 10% iodine with some alcohol in there. So the key, what you're trying to do is dry out the dry out the navel as quickly as possible and let it shrivel up as quickly as possible and clean it as well. So you need something that desiccates, something that dries and something that, that cleans. So um, yeah, I've done quite a few polls with, with some really good sheep vets and on balance, everyone likes something slightly different, but on balance, 10% um, iodine with a bit of alcohol, good alcohol content to, to dry out is, is what people look for. There, are, there is also, I can't just remember, there's a there are a couple of products um, that some vets have been using and, and like um, that dry the that dry the navel out quickly. Some people use a copper sulfate, and personally, I don't like that because it doesn't dry the navel quick enough. I don't think it's good enough, and I've seen problems with it. But um, yeah, Excellent. that's thank you. One of the uh, the most common questions um, we've had through on joint cell is: Is there any way of detecting the carrier use or screening for for them? And if there is, um, would you recommend culling these eels, um or possibly keeping them in a separate group uh, if we knew which ones they were? We honestly don't know enough about that yet. So we've just um, working and working at the moment with um, uh, Martin from border software so he's got a lot of data and we're wondering whether we can um it, it really means getting good data off people and um and that's a sort of job in progress and there's also work going on at liverpool at the moment where they did a big survey um they they're still analyzing all the data but um currently we can't identify those use um but it's worth noting if you've got use where you know the lamb had joint, it is worth noting um, that her. Uh, but but I none of us know enough yet to say definitely call that you. But we're okay. on it. We just yeah. haven't got all the answers. OK, thank you. Um, another um, key question which has come through as well is joint ill related to lame sheep. Well, lame sheep will increase the um, bacterial bacteria in the area. So. Uh, it's um, so it will increase the contamination. It's not always directly related. I think if you've got a lot of lame sheep, potentially um, you you could have more lambs with joint till. Um, you don't often get Dicylobacter in the joint till when they look at the, with the pus. Um, so uh, it's not a good idea to have a lot of lame ewes in there, and you will cause yourself more problems. Um, and potentially you could increase the joint till, but the the most common type of joint till is not associated with lameness okay thank you um, and one last question going back to betting again um, would you recommend spraying the disinfectants before or after putting the straw down or both if you were using um, a dry disinfectant for it for example in the bedding underneath the bedding you mean i i would put I would, if you were using granules or a dry disinfectant or lime, I'd put it right down the base level and then bed nicely on top. I wouldn't spray on top of the straw just because of that. It really increases the humidity and the dampness in the atmosphere, which we're trying trying to avoid. Um, okay. Um, and sorry, one final question, um, which has come through from quite a lot of our attendees tonight. Would you recommend dip, dipping the iodine on the navel or spraying it? Um, um, well, I prefer dipping because I like it to properly go all round. So if you've got yeah. the navel and you've got, a, you can properly make sure it's um, gone round. So if you, if you're really um, conscientious sprayer and you can, and you've made sure you sprayed the whole lot, but usually often there's the, the navel's quite, you, you kind of want to gather the navel up and, and put it in a cup yeah. to, to dip it. You can't you, you can't get a good enough coverage, I don't think, with a spray. And sometimes you see people that they've sprayed only from one direction, and you think, well, you've only done less than half a job there. With that, so that's definitely not going to be enough. Okay. Um, and also, how often would you recommend um, dipping again after you know after they've been born um, when you yeah. dip them then? Would you yeah. Doing it again then, and how often um, after? So, so people who have trouble with joint till, we end up going through everything, as I said, with a fine tooth comb. And one of the things we'll recommend is dip navels as soon as you see them and also do it again six weeks later. Now, sorry, six hours later. So, and some people that the joint, because 
you know, jointed is not just one single thing. What sets it off? Sometimes it's, and people put lambs into a trailer to take them out to the field. It's that trailer where the lambs are picking it up and yeah. actually um, spraying the navel, you know, A, keeping that trailer really well clean and disinfected and spraying navels as they go in and come out of there. That's a really good option. So you've got to, you know, it's sometimes a, it's a certain place in a lambing shed and sometimes it's at, at other stages. Um, so yeah. that's why you kind of got to tease it out quite a lot. Okay, great. Thank you, Fiona. I'll let you... Um, okay, yeah. I'm going to go on to colostrum. Um, because, so here's the U, here's her colostrum. And we said colostrum's gold. The re colostrum has got the two essential parts to it. So it's got the immunoglobulin. So we know we need to build up the lamb's immunity. That It's... Um, there's a perfect situation for the first 48 hours of the lamb's life in that they can absorb that colostrum, that those immunoglobulins through the, through the gut wall. But it is literally just the first, well, it's really 24 hours. Um, so uh, both, both the levels of immunoglobulins in the colostrum decline really dra dramatically in that first 48 hours. And the ability for the lamb to absorb them um, also declines really rapidly so um we need we need to get the colostrum in quickly as possible <coughs> but the other important thing it's not just the immunoglobulins <coughs> excuse me sorry but energy in colostrum is really important so um that's the other so when we 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 have a lot of lambs die from both hypothermia and um starvation uh, it's getting colostrum in them and making sure they've got that energy in them early on. That's the other important bit. But because we know how much immunoglobulins and how much energy is in colostrum, that's how we know how much a lamb needs to have in those early stages. So every lamb should get 50 mils per kilo. Now that is a lot. Um, so a four kilo lamb needs 200 mils in the first six hours. Um, I have to say, it, the lambs do need a good dose of colostrum, but it's still better for them to have it off their own mothers. And don't think um, that you're going, I, I personally would not make up powder and, and supplement every lamb. I think that's detrimental and some studies show just because you're then sort of watering down the good colostrum from the ewe. So if you need to go to powder, okay, fine, give that lamb some powder. Or if you know the lamb has not had enough, but where they've taken lambs that have had, you know, twin lambs off a mother, they've had colostrum off their mother, there's no benefit to then topping up with powder. And potentially, if that fills lamb's stomach and stops lamb going back to feed off its mother at another time, then you've caused problems. So um, that tells you a bit about colostrum. I'm just, this may or may not work. It's a, it's a, um, it's a, like a minute video. A lamb that has been charged with sufficient colostrum early enough can cope with a few bugs and a healthy population establishes. However, a colostrum deprived lamb is not able to control the multiplication of E. coli bugs. We may be able to kill them with timely antibiotics, but we get to the stage where antibiotics don't work any longer and the bugs keep multiplying. We have to do all we can to preserve antibiotics for the highest priority cases. And remember, colostrum is gold. Did that work okay? Um, hope, hopefully that was okay, that was okay, good. good. Um, basically, um, and so colostrum is important for all, um, all diseases of animals but particularly watery mouth here I know I've jumped now because but um colostrum colostrum will, will help protect the lamb against um uh watery mouth and it will also be used for a joint till we don't we can't guarantee that by giving enough colostrum we will prevent joint till so some lambs with joint till have got enough colostrum um you know we're not going to argue that but it's still really important they get enough colostrum so um we basically can't we can't um show we can't get watery mouth in a lamb that's fully um charged with colostrum um so but um 
joint and it will protect the lamb against joint till but it won't necessarily there are other factors we also have to think about with joint till if that makes sense but this business about the antibiotics um once they don't work um and the if the lab hasn't got colostrum it may work to give them antibiotics but it won't um once the antibiotics don't work anymore nothing works whereas colostrum always works decent colostrum so we've um uh we've uh we've got the there's a colostrum is goal. This has been campaign running for a couple of years. We know we can harvest spare ewe colostrum. So if ewes had a single or if ewes lost her own lambs, please get what, what colostrum you can out of her. And, and bear in mind that it is vastly superior to any substitutes. So um, whether that's powder or whether that's cow colostrum. Um, if you're collecting colostrum off a ewe, um, there are really good, and actually I should have had a photo of it. I think it's called otherwise, or it's a it's a, like a pump that you can milk it out of a ewe um, into a little pot. Those work really, really well. Uh, utterly, utterly, something like that. Um, put them, in, put it in clean containers. It will, it will cope fine in the fridge for for a week. Um, if you're going to have to keep it for longer than a week then um, you can freeze it. There was a question in the um, question box about did freezing damage it? The freezing itself doesn't damage it, but don't zap it in the microwave to defrost it because that might damage the protein. So freezing protein's fine, and then defrosting it slowly by putting it, like you do a baby's bottle into warm water is fine. Just don't put it in the microwave and put it on high and that might denature the protein and then um, damage the immunoglobulins. So um, you've got to be quite prepared if you're going to defrost it. But if you're right, if you've started lambing, you know, just have a system in your fridge and make sure that you know when you've collected it and, and you know, use it within a week. Um, we've got a lot, in fact, I know for a fact, because we have, I think there are over 150 of these bricks refractometers um, have gone to farmers in Wales and people are testing colostrum. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a useful piece of kit to have and test your colostrum. Now we're not suggesting you do that on every single U, but it gives you a good reassurance that your user producing colostrum that's of a decent quality. And then um, you can, and I'm not suggesting this is not something that you can necessarily do yourself on farm but the other thing we'll do is is blood sample lambs at two days old because it's one thing to have good colostrum but you need to make sure it's got into the lambs and the lambs have absorbed it so the the most common cause of lamb issues or lambs dying is that they've um we 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 look at the blood and find that they haven't got immunoglobulins in their bloodstream so that just means they haven't had colostrum so even though farmer thinks it's happened actually um the lamp you know somewhere along the line the the colostrum is the used colostrum is not actually getting into lambs as quickly as it should be um so it's really useful to be able to check that but um we use this um bricks both to check colostrum um and check blood supplies um the lamb blood um which is a vet thing obviously okay i'm just going this is a bit random here but I know I actually one of my favourite Welsh sheep farmers is a keen cyclist. So I just want you to bear with me. And this is my last slide. Uh, but if you know anything about cycling, we used to be a disastrous cycling team in in the UK. Um, we didn't win any medals for um, for the whole of the last century. <laughs> and then somebody else took over the team. And he was a real attention to detail person. So they did things like paint the inside of their truck white to pick up every bit of dust, every tiny bit of dust. They washed their hands. They did what all of us are now told to do. The British cycling team were doing that because they didn't want to go and do, they didn't want to go and get a cold or a virus or something. They were really meticulous about their hygiene. Um, they never shook hands because that meant they might pick up other people's diseases. I mean, it's something that none of us are doing now because we don't want to pick up COVID. They were doing that, you know, um, years ago because they wanted to be at top performance. So it's this lots and lots of little things. Um, 
and it really worked. So they, you know, I you may not follow cycling, but they won the Tour de France six six times in eight years. Um, it, it really worked. They didn't do one big thing. They did loads and loads of really, really small, what you might think were potentially insignificant. But I want every one of you to think about this for your own flock. So what areas in your lambing shed or at lambing time, it might be really small. It might be a pot of sterilizer. It might be new gloves. It might be making sure there's warm water there. Those are small things in themselves, but they are massively important when you put them all together. So don't think I'm gonna do something radical. I'm gonna change the breed of my ewes or I'm, you know, and, and, and maybe you have got really rubbish shed and you want to knock it down and build a new one. Well, that's great if you can, but, but most people have the setup they have, but you need to be thinking about every single thing that makes lambing less than perfect for you. It might be you have a wet corner of a shed and you just need to mend that dripping pipe. That's really, really important and that will make a difference. And that dripping pipe causes a wet area and causes an increase of issues and disease. So, so don't think about one big thing. Think about every single different thing we've spoken about tonight, of which there are loads but I'm quite sure everybody can make a tiny bit of improvement on each one of those. And by doing that, you're gonna increase your chance of, of, of lambs staying alive, which is the equivalent of winning gold medals in my book. And it will make lambing much more enjoyable. Um, so look after your staff because they are a really important asset and, and look after your, your ewes and your lambs and good luck with lambing. And I suspect we've got more questions, haven't we, Gwar? Um, yes, Fiona, thank you very much. Um, we've Can just I stop sharing my screen? Yes, of course, yeah. So um, we just have a few um, of the final questions which have come through. Thank you, every, everybody who has submitted questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to go through them all tonight. Um, or we'll be here until tomorrow morning. Um, so in terms of having triplets and... Um, yeah, so if, if you do have a lot of triplets, is it a good idea to take one of the mother straight away or do you suggest leaving um, the lamb, the extra lamb with her for a few hours? Um, I, I actually know someone who, who keeps triplets on them for five weeks. So I don't, yeah, I, I would, um, I wouldn't say there's definitely a right and a wrong way to do it. If you're going to keep triplets on for any length of time, the key thing is to keep feeding that, make sure that you has got really good water and food she, to, to, be, to be milking. So the, the main issue with leaving any triplets on is getting mastitis. Um, uh, we do need triplets to get whatever colostrum and we need all of them to have some and that is a massive struggle for triplets. Um, that's why none of us want none, none of us want chiplets. We all want twins. Um, so, yeah, there's no right answer. But if you are keeping chiplets on, feed the ewes as much as you can. Um, I did notice a question there about the joint ill and different causes. So, one of the things that causes joint ill in older lambs, and I'm talking a month or older, um, is erysipelas is a possibility. Um, but a lot of people have honestly gone away and thought this, this is what is causing jointil in my flock. And, and almost always jointil is caused by streptoscalactiae. But um, if you are worried about erysipelas in older lambs, then get your vets to blood sample. In fact, I blood sampled some sheep just, just recently and um, old, older animals, and, and it was erysipelas. But do not assume that that's the case in in lambs because it's um, much, much more likely to be streptoscalactiae. Um, one of the, uh, well, I think um, two questions which have come up also, um, Fiona, before we finish, um, have um, come from, uh, well, most probably a plant farmers, uh, which lamb outside, which are having um, issues with ticks um, and then consequently joint ill and issues afterwards. Um, what would you suggest would be the best way of addressing this other than treating the individuals as they show symptoms? Is there any method of preventing it at all? Um, so so if, you're, if you've got lambs out and ticks and they're picking up tick pyemia, then um, it's a case of, of literally um, 
antiparasite as they go out so it's a spot on or something but at a very very young age and it's it's tricky it's very difficult if you've got lambs with joint and you need to treat them then it is antibiotic you need to get on them as quickly as possible um and so quite a long course of antibiotics um and painkillers as well um but once they've got once the arthritis has set in then um you you, you really struggle to to treat um yeah. Okay. Uh, people have asked about storing colostrum so a fridge a freezer is possible but be careful as you defrost it somebody asked about feeding fodder beet fodder beet is brilliant for energy um i i want to give something more protein in right at the late stages of of um pregnancy um to get uh protein protein's really important particularly the last two three weeks before they lamb uh, yeah and sanitizing then the, the iodine and the spirit. So if you've um if if you've got surgical spirit, uh, ear tags and castration rings, I would I would um put in surgical spirit as I as I use them, and I would also swab it on the ear or on the on the lamb itself. Okay, great. Thank you, Fiona. Um I think yeah, I think we've gone a bit over time um, tonight, but thank you very much, Fiona, for your for your very informative presentation. Um, I'm sure we've all learned something different um, and something new tonight. Um, hopefully, we'll all be able to put um, a lot of the stuff that you've um, discussed tonight into practice uh, during the next few weeks, and hopefully, um, avoid any issues um, if possible. Um, with uh, watery mouth and joint ill and so on. So thank you very, very much for this evening. Um, just to let you know also, we do have a webinar coming up on the 28th of this month, which is looking at maintaining AU health pre-lamming, um, looking at um, you know the regular pre-lamming issues which we tend to come across health-wise, including um, twin lamb, prolapse, um, acidosis and listeri listeria, listeria in EUs and so on, um, as well as the prevention and treatment and also a bit on metabolic profiling um, in that as well. So if you are interested, head over to the Farming Connect website um, to the What's On tab on the top and you can register for that webinar. Um, also, could I ask you nicely, please, um, when you will be exiting this webinar now, um, there will be a feedback form coming up on your screen. We would be really grateful if you could just take a few minutes just to fill that out, please, um, just so that we can see um, if there are areas uh, which we need to improve on for future webinars, and if, um, also if there are any particular topics you'd like us to cover um, in the future as well. Um, we'd really appreciate that, um, if you can, please. Um, and just on a final note, thank you very much um, to all of you which have attended tonight and interacted with us um, by asking questions and so on. Um, it's been a, a really good session. So thank you all and thank you, Fiona, and good night, everybody. Thank you.